This morning I have a, a topic that's a little bit tough because I think it steps on most of our toes this morning. What I'm going to be talking about this morning is uh, sexual purity. I'm going to be talking seriously about what God expects uh, for our lives. I, I think sometimes we're afraid to approach certain subjects because we're afraid that, that folks might uh, uh, think that uh, we're being judgmental or that we're uh, trying to condemn one person and not the other person. I, I find that people are, are in all kinds of situations in life. But I find God's love is consistent in every one of those situations. Amen? And it doesn't matter what we have done. It doesn't matter what decisions we have made. It doesn't matter exactly where we're at right now. God loves us. God wants us uh, to feel that love, to know him, and to be redeemed, and to enjoy uh, the life that he has for us. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me uh, to Matthew chapter 5 uh, in your Bibles. We're going to continue on uh, through looking at the heart of Matthew, looking at what Jesus is trying to get us to understand about how to live our lives. Uh, and, and really, Matthew is a story of Jesus and his teachings, so we can find out much about the kind of life we're supposed to live. I, I was reading about this uh, a fellow in uh, English history. He was uh, uh, named uh, Reynald, and he was one of the three Edwards, uh, and there's a book by that name, Thomas uh, Costan's History, and he describes what happened in, in history with uh, Rinaldo. Rinaldo was grossly overweight, uh, and after a, a violent quarrel, uh, his younger brother, Edward, led a successful revolt against him, uh, and when he did, he built a room, uh, captured him, built a room around him. Uh, and held him in that room, uh, kind of in an unusual way, because in this room he put normal-sized doors and normal-sized windows, which meant that Ronaldo could not get out of the room unless he began to make some different choices. Uh, so to keep him uh, in the room, to keep from having trouble with the general populace about him overthrowing his older brother uh, in the, the reign of, of, of the kingdom, what he needed to do, Ronaldo needed to do, was lose weight. But what his brother did instead, Edward, was to provide for him every day a, a nice tray of scrumptious food. <laughs> All that he wanted to eat. And Ronaldo, Ronaldo stayed in that room uh, until uh, later when Edward died in battle. I, I think of, about that. I think so many times that's a description of my own life, of my yielding to temptation instead of doing what is best for me. God has this better person for me to be, but oftentimes with the temptations that Satan provides around me, uh, I refuse to be that better person because it takes some discipline in my life. Right? It takes some discipline. But many of us are like Ronaldo, trapped by our own sinful desires, in a prison of our own making, so to speak, uh, easily freed from that prison if we just make some different choices in our life. But, you know, it could be uh, uh, that, that the pleasure for us is gossip, or it could be pornography, it could be uh, alcohol or other drugs. Uh, perhaps the temptation is to eat fatty foods or the temptation is to live beyond our means on the credit cards or, or whatever that is. Oftentimes we lack the willpower to overcome the temptation and be what God wants us to be. I want us today to understand how Satan is going to tempt us, especially in sexual matters, and how we should live above that temptation, the kind of life that we should live instead. Uh, look at there in Matthew chapter 5. Would you stand in honor of God's word, please, with me as we read it? Matthew chapter 5. Jesus is pointing out the deeper meaning of the law. Now, I remind you from previous sermons that, that he wants us as Christians to understand the purpose of God's law 
and to live by that purpose. We don't have to live by the letter of man's interpretation of that law, but we do have to live by the deeper purpose that God gave us those laws for. And so he says uh, there in chapter 5, uh, there in verse 27, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks on a woman to lust for her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. For it is better for you that one of the parts of your body perish than your whole body to be thrown into hell. Now if your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. For it is better for you that one of the parts of your body perish than your whole body to go into hell. And it was said, whoever divorces his wife, let her give a certificate of the dismissal. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except for the cause of unchastity, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Let's bow together. Our Father, we thank you for your word. Even the sections that are hard to understand or hard to apply. Father, I pray that you would help us to live by the truth of your word. Lord, to take it to heart. And Lord, to in, enjoy the person you want us to be. Lord, to be able to enjoy the life that you have destined for us to live. And Lord, help us to overcome those temptations. And Lord, help us to stay away from those things uh, that lead us into uh, the wrong desires and the wrong uh, influences in our life, Father. Grant to us your spirit so that we can live not by our strength, but by your strength to overcome the evil in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I, I want you to understand with me that God had a purpose for sexual relationships. It is always within a context of marriage. And God doesn't have a lot of restrictions within marriage, but he does restrict us to marriage for fulfillment of sexual desires. Uh, I want to turn, if you have your Bibles open, go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 2. Here we find the establishment of marriage. You know, God only created uh, two institutions. Uh, he didn't create what I always say, the Kiwanis Club. I, I'm going to join that club someday just so I can speak with some <laughs> knowledge, I think. Uh, but he didn't create the Elks or the Moose or any other animals club. Uh, he created two institutions that would serve us well throughout our generations. First of all, the first one had to do with our intimate family relationships. A man shall leave his wife, cleave to, or leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, uh, and the two shall become one flesh. So look, look at that passage there uh, in verse uh, 24 of chapter 2 of Genesis. It says, For this cause a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And a man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. And, and I, I think about that passage, and I think about God's design for marriage. Uh, God designed marriage to be one man and one woman together for a lifetime, as long as you both shall live, as often said uh, in marriage vows. Uh, tag together for a lifetime. That's his design. Now, oftentimes that design gets messed up. Sometimes by things that are even our cause. Sometimes by a mistake of our own that we repent from, but we can't change the consequences. But his design oftentimes gets messed up, doesn't it? Uh, here, I, I, I don't want to take away from his design, though. You understand what I'm saying? I want us to say to everyone here, and I know there's people in all kinds of life situations with pasts that are different. I want to say to you, God has a standard. And God loves us more than you can imagine. So even if we break that standard, he still loves us. Amen? And has a plan for our lives. I don't want you to, to think that, that God is... is that you messed up God's design so that you can never get right again. We're going to talk about God's remedies at the end of this sermon. I do want you to know that God loves you no matter what has happened in the past. 
and he has a future for you, and he can, but it doesn't take away from his design. You understand what I'm saying? I think sometimes we want to lower God's standards so that we can feel good about where we're at. And Jesus is saying that's not right. He's saying you've heard that it was that it was said that you shall not commit adultery. But I say unto you, if you look after a woman with lust in your eyes, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. Now that same can be said about women as well, right? <laughs> So if you look after somebody else with lust in your eyes, you've already... So I, I guess that means that we've probably all broken that one at one point or another in life, right? I think so. I, at least I know so for me. <laughs> and maybe for Rod. I don't know. You didn't shake your head, Rod. I'm kind of nervous <laughs> here. <laughs> Kenny was over there agreeing with me. <laughs> we've all broken that to some degree. But it doesn't take away from God's design. God's desire, God's plan. Uh, you understand what I'm saying? We can all ha repent of what we've done wrong, breaking his design, but we can all realize that his design is still the best way. It's still the right way, and we can go back to that design as soon as we can, right? That's, that's what God would desire uh, for us to do. His, his design is that that one man and one woman shall live together for a lifetime. It, his design is that there would be uh, sex, that he, uh, sex drives the, the desire uh, to uh, be in an intimate relationship with the, a person of the opposite sex. That drive, that desire is God-given. That's God-given. And within the context of marriage, within the concept, context of courtship and, and eventual marriage, then when that marriage occurs, all that can be complete and be right and be good, right? That's what God has designed it for. God gives us many. We talked about anger last week. If you missed that, <laughs> uh, I'm really mad at you for <laughs> not coming. <No. laughs> we talked about anger last week. And, and anger is a God-given emotion in the right context. It's given to us for a purpose, right? It's given to us for a reason. In the right context, it's a good thing. Sexual desires are the same thing. Within the right context, they're a very good thing to be intimate. It says in that Genesis passage that we read just a minute ago, uh, after it says, a man shall leave his father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, it says, and a man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. What does that mean? It means they had a, an intimacy. It, it, well, I know. It means they didn't have any clothes on. <laughs> I understand that part. But the fact is they didn't have anything to hide from each other. They were in such an intimate relationship that they didn't have any shame. Any shame. That's God's design for a marriage. God's design for a marriage is that you be in a trusting relationship with one other person for the rest of your life to where there is no shame, to where it is a relationship of love and compassion, and within that, there is intimacy as well, to where you know that other person intimately, uh, not just sexually, but in mind and, and heart as well. Have you ever met a couple that uh, have been together for quite some time, and, and, and you to see one, you expect to see the other? Somehow they're incomplete <laughs> without their other half. Uh, some would say the better half, and we could debate <laughs> upon which that would be. <laughs> but without their other half, they seem to be incomplete because they're so close to one another. That's God's design, to have that kind of intimate relationship with another human being in the context of marriage uh, to where you have that one warm, wonderful fulfillment of a, of a God-designed marriage. Uh, his design is that we have purity and thought and action. And, and, and I need to say here, I think sometimes uh, we have messed that up, haven't we? Uh, in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 7, it says, It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality. Well, it's interesting that that term, a sexual immorality, that translation of that is the word poneria, uh, which uh, we get the word pornography from. Uh, and, and really what it's saying is that that relationship 
uh, of sexual uh, sin that, that we can have. Uh, he said, should avoid sexual immorality and that each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the heathen, heathens, but who do not know God and that in this matter no one should wrong his brother or take advantage of him. The Lord will punish men for all such sins as we have already told you and warned you. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Christian does not reject man, but God who gives you his Holy Spirit. God has this perfect design, a design for us to be morally pure, uh, morally in our thought life, in our actions, uh, to, to be pure. Uh, but man's perversion of God's design leads to many different kinds of arrangements. 